Hello and welcome to this series where I'm going to be building a RISC-V CPU on an FPGA in TypeScript. Um, now, if you've never seen any of my videos before, then that probably sounds uh, completely insane. And if you have seen any of my videos, then you probably think it's just completely normal. Um, and I'll get into exactly how that's going to work in a bit. But uh, yeah, this is pretty much the beginning of a really interesting journey where I'm going to build my first processor. So, uh, let's start out kind of with the obvious question, what is RISC-V? Well, RISC-V is an open source instruction set architecture specification, and I'm not sure if I've said that in the best way or the most official way, but that's kind of what it is. Um, what that means is that there is an open document, set of documents, set of standards that you can go to the RISC-V website, download and take a look at. And in fact, uh, you can see that I have one of the specifications open here. Um, you can go to the website, you can download these specifications and they tell you kind of exactly how the interface for this CPU needs to work. Um, and then you can go away and you can implement that interface in something like an FPGA, but also on actual silicon chips. And then you can produce those and you can sell them and you don't have to pay any royalties to anyone. And that's kind of quite a big uh, paradigm shift in how this kind of industry works. Um, it's a really exciting time. And uh, there are even now some commercial RISC-V processors, I believe Espressive, who create the ESP32 and ESP86, 8622. Um, they've made their own RISC-V uh, core, and I believe you can already get it. Um, I don't have one myself. Anyway, so it's really cool. It's an open, uh, it's an open uh, architecture, and the base architecture is a 32-bit uh, word size, and it actually has extensions for, you know, even bigger word sizes like 64 and even larger. And uh, and yeah, and it's a it's a RISC architecture. Obviously, it's in the name, but RISC V and RISC architecture are two different things. RISC architecture is a general concept um, that have that has some sort of properties about the architecture. Um, one of those is that it's generally a small instruction set. Um, and it's designed to pack tons and tons of information into, say, a 32-bit word. Um, you can really get a lot of information into a 32-bit word, and it's actually really impressive. Like, as we go through this series, and we read through the specification, uh, specification documents, and we implement instructions, you'll see just how uh, impressive it, it really is, and how well thought out it is. But, uh, yeah, instructions are usually fixed width in RISC architecture, uh, so yeah, everything has to fit in this 32 bits, and that has probably, um, well, if you kind of think hard about it, there are some things to that, like, well, that means that if you've got one instruction and everything has to fit in the, you know, the 32 bit word, and you want to, like, load an address, which is also in a 32 bit address space, you don't have access to the whole uh, address space, so things like that are relative, if you need to load, um, uh, if you need to load in uh, an address or something like that. Either it's going to be relative or it's not going to be able to target the entire address space. But there are really smart ways around that in that basically make it so that doesn't really matter. Um, okay, and yeah, you probably know that there are many ar uh, architectures uh, that are RISC out there. Things like ARM. ARM is a, a set of uh, RISC architectures. You've got MIPS, you've got Spark, and there are, there are others. Uh, yeah, okay, so RVI32 is the base definition. That's the integer 32-bit RISC-V instruction set. And it's really simple. Um, it only has like a handful of kind of opcodes that you have to deal with. Um, and that implements a whole range of uh, behavior like loading and storing from memory and doing arithmetic and logical stuff and some systematic stuff and branching and jumping and yeah that's pretty much it and then there are uh, sort of add-ons extensions that you can implement to further uh, you know enhance your processor 
like adding things like multiply and divide instructions, and uh, those have to conform to a standard. Adding like a floating point unit and implementing the sort of minimal set of floating point operations that you need for that. There's like an atomic extension for if you uh, need certain things to uh, execute atomically, and there are a bunch of others as well. And it's uh, yeah, it's really cool. And I mean, we might get into that uh, later on. And yeah, it has an unprivileged and a privileged uh, specification. And so an unprivileged s set of instructions is basically, <clears throat> well, uh, it's like bare metal. And you just run whatever code you want on this chip and uh, it's going to do it. There's no regard to uh, a sort of levels of hierarchy. And in a privileged system, that's when you start to have a breakdown of like what user code can do and what, you know, sort of systematic code, kernel kind of code can do. And that's how you can implement things like Linux. Uh, you need those kind of, um, uh, you need those kind of levels of uh, uh, privilege uh, in place. I hope some of that made sense. It's a, kind of a lightning fast introduction and I'm also not an expert. Um, so there's this next question which isn't going to have been prompted to your mind because where would that come up? But Gateware TS is this um, is this library that I've written, uh, which is a hardware definition library, kind of like hardware definition language, that's embedded in the TypeScript programming language. And what that means is you can specify hardware um, in TypeScript, and then you can take that description and turn it into something that can run on an FPGA, or actually if you wanted to, something that could become a silicon chip. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of a relatively common thing to do these days. There are embedded HDLs in Python, uh, in Scala, in OCaml, in a lot of the functional languages, but yeah, also in things like C++ and Rust. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of these different embedded uh, uh, HDLs, and this happens to be the one that I've written, and uh, yeah, and kind of it works great for this channel because this channel is low-level JavaScript, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, let's make the weirdest and the most like obscenely low-level stuff uh, in a language that really doesn't seem like it should be used for that, and that's kind of the fun of it. Uh, so Gateway TS, I've actually already made a video about Gateway TS. Um, so in that video, which you can check out, I'll leave a link in the description. Um, in this video, I made uh, an hardware LED panel driver. So in, uh, one of these 64 by 64 RGB LED panels that you see in big video wall displays. Uh, I built a driver for that using this... Um, FPGA that you see there on the left, uh, which is a lattice chip, and it's on this open hardware icebreaker board, which is an excellent uh, board, and it's an excellent FPGA, and it works with these open source FPGA toolchains, so it's super cool. And I've re recently rewritten this whole uh, library, the whole Gateway TS library, um, to kind of fix some of the problems that I had and some of the things that I've encountered just while building um, Kind of demos and, and things uh, playing around with it and I think I've gotten it to a point where it's actually you know nice and powerful and uh, yeah produces some some good stuff so it's a it's an HDL embedded in TypeScript it compiles to Verilog which is an actual hardware definition language um, and then you can take that Verilog and you can pipe that into whatever tool chain you need to need to use so my plan for this series, and it's not completely uh, set in stone, but my plan is to use um, this FPGA board that I have here, which is an RTA7 board, and uh, this has a Xilinx FPGA on it, quite a quite a decent um, one, definitely enough for this purpose. Uh, people have run RISC-V processors on much less powerful FPGAs with way less resources, but this board's it's pretty great. It's got a bunch of input-output that we can use. It's got, you know, all these kind of like uh, switches, it's got buttons, it's got LEDs for output, it's got a UART serial connection with an FTDI chip on there. So it's, uh, it's a pretty pretty nice, pretty useful board. Um, 
And yeah, so the language to target for this, this uses proprietary uh, Xilinx tools uh, in order to program it. Um, so yeah, the idea is to take the, the Verilog that comes out of Gateway TS to pipe it into um, the Xilinx tools, and that's kind of that will kind of be the step, and uh, it should be fairly minimal. Um, so it's type safe and also sort of compile time check, uh, or I guess runtime uh, safe, which means that there's a bunch of stuff that I've built into the just the way that the the types are defined for this. Um, embedded HDL that will allow you to avoid making certain kinds of mistakes, which is just very nice because Verilog actually lets you make quite a lot of mistakes. In some ways it's kind of like the, uh, the JavaScript of the hardware language world. Um, and the runtime safety uh, comes in the form of like checking all of your definition uh, when you come to generate the Verilog code and just making sure that you haven't done kind of insane things that also Verilog will let you do, like doing operations on two like two numbers or two signals uh, that have like different widths, which is just doesn't make sense. It's kind of like trying to add uh, an 8-bit integer to a 16-bit integer but not having any strategy for like what you're going to do with those missing bits or how it's going to kind of go. So it's kind of, uh, it's not really undefined behavior, but it's, a, it's a kind of a, a place where you can make mistakes. Um, it's not meant to be production ready uh, by any means. It's something that uh, I'm messing around with and that I like to, to use and I don't expect anyone else to use. Um, if you do want to use it, that's fine. You can also come and chat about it on the low level uh, JavaScript uh, Discord channel, which you'll find uh, below. Um, but yeah, it's it's really a, a fun experiment, and I've had a lot of fun just building this kind of language and a compiler, and you know, doing some basic uh, you know optimizations and uh, and transformations that you can do when you build this kind of uh, tooling. Uh, the code is also online uh, on GitHub. I'll also leave a link to that. Uh, so it's designed to work with open source and vendor tool chains. Uh, my first iteration of it worked like really closely with the open source tool chains and I didn't want the my idea was that you could you could run everything without having to interact with any other tools you would just install them and you could run a command uh, you know just run your your uh, TypeScript um, uh, in the, like node or TS node and uh, and it would just build you a bitstream and you could flash that directly to a, a to an open source board. But yeah, of course, with the with the vendor tools and this kind of thing, you actually need the Verilog to come out. So that's that. Uh, this is the board that I was talking about. It's an RT-A7 100T Xilinx FPGA board. And uh, yeah, this is kind of, uh, well, maybe now is just a good time to, to actually uh, just cross the bridge of what an FPGA is, if you don't know, because you, well, good, well done for sort of staying in the video at that point. Um, an FPGA, uh, the kind of really um, bad example of what an FPGA is, like the bad description that people give, is like, it's a chip which is sort of a big bag of logic gates that haven't been connected together yet. Um, you know, all chips are basically logic gates and transistors. Um, and what you get to do is you, you describe uh, in a, in a high-level uh, way which means you don't describe logic gate by logic gate, but more like in the level of like registers that are synchronized with the clock. You describe uh, hardware in some sort of language, and that slowly gets turned into a description of logic gates, and that gets kind of burned onto the chip. And then the chip, it doesn't get burned on, it gets loaded uh, every time the chip is powered on. And, and then that is the description of the chip, and it sort of is that chip, and it's sort of as fast, well, it's not quite as fast as a silicon chip, but it's a it's pretty pretty fast, much faster than a microcontroller, which you could program to do the same specific tasks, and you can really do things clock cycle by clock cycle, and really describe all of that kind of super low level, super efficient, super parallel uh, operations. Um, the reality, though, is that it's not a big bag of logic gates. It's actually um, uh, this big interconnected network of uh, kind of tiny bits of hardware that are all configurable. 
So <clears throat> the base, uh, you have these little logic cells which are made up of things like lookup tables which are configurable, and a lookup table is basically just uh, you know, a little matrix for which you can say, if I give you these inputs, I want these outputs, you know? If you have something like that, you can make every logic gate super easily, but you can also, um, by, by packing these things together in certain ways, you can more efficiently describe uh, logic systems, and, you, and sort of more efficiently than you would with a set of logic gates. Um, yeah, so you have those. You also have uh, little memory cells, little flip-flops inside, and those, uh, they're like D-type flip-flops, and so you can use these to store stuff. Um, so normally, in a logic cell, as it were, uh, you have some lookup tables, you have a flip-flop, you have uh, different signals coming in from the inside and the outside in different ways you can output things. Um, and that kind of, what you can do is you can compile the Verilog down into a description that fits that format, and then it will kind of basically wire everything together in this big network and work out all of the timing and all of that kind of stuff and uh, that becomes the chip. Um, it kind of works in the same way. Uh, the other part is that you also have um, more specific hardware built in, so you also have stuff like BRAM, Block RAM, which is you know really small amounts of super fast um, RAM built directly into the FPGA. Uh, in various places that you can link up with your uh, with your lookup tables and your little flip flop memories, and you can use that RAM inside, so you don't have to waste your logic gate, so to speak, on building things like RAM. It's just it's just there. And likewise, you also have like uh, DSP units, you know, digital signal processing units, which can do stuff like multiply and accumulate. So you get those kind of operations also uh, pretty cheaply. And different FPGAs have different combinations of these different kinds of hardware. <clears throat> it's also really hard to compare them because uh, you know, a Xilinx FPGA might have a six, I'm, I'm guessing these numbers right now because I don't know them off the top of my head, it might have a six input lookup table and other FPGAs might only have a four input lookup table or a two input lookup table. And uh, of course, if you're just seeing something like this FPGA has a 15,000, uh, roughly 15,000 lookup tables, then, you know, if you don't know the number of inputs, then it's kind of uh, almost meaningless. Um, it also has then, for instance, 65,000-ish flip-flops built in, and about 600 kilobytes of BRAM, uh, kibibytes. I'm trying to say that more now so that people don't uh, get pedantic at me on the internet. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of like resources just built into this FPGA. There is also, on this board, uh, in this area here, right next to the FPGA, this is the FPGA chip, by the way, this is a little DDR3 memory of 256 megabytes. And uh, yeah, that's connected directly to the FPGA. And uh, yeah, with a little bit of magic, um, we can make those two things talk to each other. And so that is a really useful, <laughs> that turns the CPU into something useful straight away, right? Because um, we don't have to rely on just the small amount of memory in the chip. Obviously we've got all of this, uh, all of these ports here where signals can come in and out of the, of the FPGA. All of these different things are wired up to the FPGA. <clears throat> Likewise, the buttons and the switches and the LEDs, they're also wired up directly to the FPGA. There's another chip up here, um, which is a flash memory that actually holds the what's called the bitstream, which is like the kind of FPGA program, the configuration. Um, but it's 16 megabytes, so it's a 16 megabyte flash chip. Um, you can also store stuff on there, so probably the... Um, you know, whatever compiled programs that are going to run on the CPU eventually will probably get stored in there. FTDI chip for speaking USB. There's also an Ethernet controller. There's an Ethernet port on here. Probably not going to do anything with that for now. Uh, yeah, it's pretty capable, this uh, thing. It should, it should, uh, it should um, be able to make up for any lack of skill that I have in that way, hopefully. Um, so this is just the, the disclaimer part. Like, I'm not an expert. I'm not a hardware designer by trade or you know, any any description, really. I'm a software uh, person. I just really like this kind of stuff, and uh, and I think this is a really great opportunity to learn more and more about it. I've been reading a lot more about uh, computer architecture lately, 
and uh, yeah, I'm just sort of really excited to, to make a CPU. It's something I've wanted to do for a really, really long time now. Actually, when it, I think I actually first sort of actually only first heard of FPGAs in around 2017, I think, um, and uh, and then. I kind of, uh, yeah, I fell in love with the idea of building my own uh, CPU, and I just haven't gotten to that yet. So, I'm not an expert, not a professional hardware designer. I'll definitely make mistakes during this whole process. Um, I'll probably do things in a stupid way. So, uh, if you're a professional hardware designer, you'll probably look at some of the stuff that the choices that I make and think, "What a waste of resources!" Or that's uh, that's gonna not that's not gonna work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm going to do those kind of things, and that's that's fine, you know. It's fine as long as I can uh, fix it in the end and make it work and learn something from it. I'm okay with it. Um, and I'll probably casually say things incorrectly as well. Um, I may have even done so in this uh, in this very video. Um, but yeah, I think I've already recorded the first couple of uh, videos in this series, so you'll if you if you go and find those, which there'll be at least one of them online now. Um, you'll see that I have longer hair and that, uh, that yeah, it's kind of a different day and different setup. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure that I already said a couple of things wrong in some of those videos. I'll try and correct myself if I get things wrong. And, um, yeah, I'm open to input and I'm open to suggestions, so, um, yeah, just feel free to leave comments and stuff. Uh, just try and do it in a friendly way and, uh, yeah, it, it will make a nice, uh, a nice conversation, a nice learning thing for everyone. All right. Uh, that's the disclaimer. This is the plan. My plan is to first uh, just, well, generally just be as simple as possible. I kind of want to do uh, like the minimum amount, and I mean that in so many different ways. Like, uh, I want to just run bare metal, so I don't want to have privilege levels. Maybe later, but not, not for now. Um, and yeah, I also, I want to implement like a proper pipeline in this CPU, like so I want to have a pipeline CPU, but in my first implementation, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that in the stupidest possible way, and that is I'm going to have a pipeline but with no parallelism. Uh, so I'm going to, if this, if you don't know anything about uh, CPU design or anything, don't worry, but what I'm basically saying is I'm going to, you know, un, like not implement any of the innovations of, uh, <laughs> of like the past 50 years or something. Um, I'm going to build the pipeline in, and I'm going to build the CPU around that design, but I'm not going to have it parallel in the first place. I just want to get like code running on it first, and then once it's running, then I'm going to go back and like make the changes to make it parallel. And it will be really cool to measure the performance difference. I think that will be something fun. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things. I'm going to start out by building a software emulator before I actually start building the hardware. And uh, I'll explain more about the specific reasons for that in a minute. Um, it's going to have memory mapped I.O. Uh, so that means that, you know, uh, the address space won't only be used for talking to memory, but by reading and writing certain uh, addresses that will actually allow us to talk to other pieces of hardware and other configuration registers and things like that other ways of just controlling the CPU and just using the address space as a kind of interface on top of that um, so of course we're going to need some to build some memory controller hardware on the FPGA to kind of dis like decode the addresses and work out if they should go to memory or they should go to something else and just as an example, some of the other things that we'll have are being able to read and write registers and just instantly turn on things like the LEDs, uh, to be able to read the values of the buttons, for example, the switches, uh, to be able to talk to the serial port. Um, all of that stuff is going to be in the address space. And then, uh, and then, yeah, so when I've built a software emulator and that's all working, um, then we're going to build the real hardware. And so let's just talk about the emulator for a second, because maybe you think, what a what a cop out! Why would you build an emulator when you're supposed to be building this hard? You know, you're making these claims about building, uh, you know, the world's first uh, Risk Five uh, TypeScript uh, processor. I haven't made that claim yet, but I, I did just now. Um, well, the reason for it is is that like creating hardware for FPGAs, it's just hard in general, like there are so many different things that can trip you up, uh, kind of that 
parallel way of thinking that you have to think when like you're running an electrical circuit. You're describing an electrical circuit, actually. Uh, as much as it looks like a programming language, it's actually a circuit. And you always need to remember that. Um, and yeah, there are just things that can go wrong there, so it's just kind of hard to get that right, as well as sort of just understanding a instruction set architecture specification is also kind of hard. Uh, the information is like densely packed and, uh, you know, every word carries meaning and you really need to understand what you're doing. So that, that's another place to make mistakes, you know, kind of just, just understanding all of these different things is hard. But then also, you know, FPGAs have uh, timing stuff that you really have to think about hard and you kind of have to get right. There are all these other things like dealing with protocols and talking to other bits of hardware and, you know, like talking to the flash chip is going to involve building, you know, probably some sort of SPI communication from scratch on the FPGA. Um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. A lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of places to go wrong. So what I'm trying to do is just start out with something that allows us to solve a bunch of those hard problems um, in a kind of nice, comfortable, easily debuggable environment. And uh, I also want to build like a really low level emulator. <clears throat> so I've built a few different kinds of virtual machines and emulators and things like that now. And uh, from what I understand, you know, I'm not an expert on that also by any means, but from what I understand uh, in like the emulator development community and like for games consoles and stuff, you typically don't emulate the CPU on such a low level, you don't implement things like the pipeline, for example, um, because you just sort of don't need to. Uh, you can you can do so much just by saying, okay, uh, you know, four clock cycles passed while we tried to do this, and then two more two more passed while I while I did this, and, and you know, as long as you can kind of keep on top of that and what happens in the on the clock cycles, you don't really need to uh, go too far with it. And there are exceptions, like, uh, there are some CPUs, like, uh, you know, MIPS, in, in, uh, which is another RISC architecture, has uh, something called a delay slot, um, which is when you're doing a branching instruction, like a, some kind of conditional jump, um, the instruction that comes after the branch instruction is always executed, which is something that just sort of, if you don't understand why that happens, that's just the weirdest thing, like, why would you build that system? You know, why would you build a system where, like, you do a, a little branch and you need to jump over here, but first just execute one more instruction? And uh, part of that is actually is for a pipelining reason. Like, there's, a, there's something that goes into that. So, um, I want to build the, the pipeline into the into the emulator as well because that's just a something to something to kind of discuss and understand and see how we're going to build. The major sections of the CPU that way, kind of how we're going to break down in modules. Um, it's going to allow us to get familiar with the architecture, with the instruction set, with the tool chain, which is something else um, entirely. You know, that's the great thing about using uh, something like RISC V, which is just this open architecture. It comes with a tool chain, so you don't need to build a compiler from scratch. Uh, you just get that. So we don't need to write assembly to sort of write, you know, I don't know, the bootloader that will run on the CPU, kind of set everything up, and then all the programs that will run on top of it. Now you can write in C, because there's a tool chain, and then like, you can take your C and compile it, and then you can put that on the, on the RISC-V. Super cool. Yeah, so it's just a testbed, and a place to get familiar, and uh, yeah, I think it will be a really cool way of doing it. <clears throat> so then, we're going to move on to the hardware, and uh, well, yeah, kind of the way I want to tackle this is like, obviously, I'm just going to like build the CPU, and I'm going to build like the connection to memory, and I'm going to build like the memory, uh, the MMO controller, and all of that kind of stuff. But um, there's one like really key thing, and it's like one of the first things you build when you're learning to play with FPGAs, and that's like a serial port. And a serial port is like literally like the old school serial port that you, you know, there was a port on computers back in the day. Um, it's just sort of just around uh, the time when I was using computers, there was a serial port. Um, and then that would connect to devices, like external devices. That's been completely replaced by USB these days. 
<clears throat> but it lives on because uh, because there are these super popular chips, these FP FTDI chips, uh, which I don't know if the zoom, if the focus is going to allow me to do this, but FTDI chip is just there, and that chip basically takes USB signals and turns them into like these old school. Uh, uh, transmit and receive lines that basically pulse up and down at a certain interval to transmit information. It's a really slow format, but it's really, really simple and it's uh, a really great way of sending information. And actually, you know, it lives on in this kind of space because um, Arduinos use it and all that kind of stuff. You want to put your firmware onto a onto a chip. It's uh, you pretty much do it over serial most of the time. Um, yeah, so we're going to build one of these serial ports. And it's relatively simple hardware, but it does involve um, it does actually involve some some digital design concepts, which are you know like you need to think about things like state machines. You need to think about like things taking a certain amount of clock cycles. You need to count. You need to wait to do things. You need to read and write signals that like coming off the the board. And then you need to build things like FIFOs, which are, uh, you know, a really common, like, abstraction tool in, uh, in digital design, which is basically like you take a, it's like a memory, you probably used it in programming terms, it's a first in, first out queue, so basically you put something in, and then when you want, all you can do is put something in and take something out, and when you put something in, um, you put a few things in, you, when you take something out, you always get the first thing you put in. And it's the same, the idea here, you can use it as a buffer, you know, because the data might come in faster into the serial port than we can deal with it on the chip itself. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so you use something like a FIFO and you build that out of something like a block RAM, um, and that allows you to, yeah, to create this nice interface where you've got stuff coming in, it goes into this nice interface, and on the other side of the interface is the CPU. Uh, yeah, so it's just like a great little first micro project, um, and I think that will allow us to get familiar with Gateway TS. It will allow us to get familiar with some, uh, you know, some digital design stuff with the board itself. Uh, see if there's any, you know, strange things to worry about with timing. Um, yeah, and then we can build the CPU. Uh, we're going to build the CPU with a pipeline, a five-stage classic risk pipeline. Um, and if you don't know what a pipeline is, basically, well, I explained it just a little bit before, but a pipeline is a way of modularizing the CPU's functionality where you break down the things into different stages. And so the first stage is like instruction fetch. You go and take uh, an instruction out of memory or instruction cache or something. <clears throat> that takes one clock cycle in the ideal case. And then... Um, there's another piece of hardware next to it, and they're, they're kind of mutually exclusive from each other, but they've got, you know, they can send each other um, the results of their operation. The next stage is something like decode, where you take the instruction that you've just been handed, and you try and work out what you need to do. Like, what kind of instruction is this? Do I need to read some memory? Am I going to need to, like, look at my registers and pull those out? Is it going to, are we going to be doing arithmetic? Are we branching? All that kind of stuff. You figure that out there. So you kind of pull the bits of the instruction apart. And then you build up a bunch of values that represent, you know, the next part. And then you can pass it to the next stage. And then the next stage is the execute stage. And then that is where basically you take all of this decoded information and you run it through like the, the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. And that is where you're going to do things like adding numbers together and you're going to, uh, you know, do logical operations like AND or XOR. Uh, in risk 5 there's uh, one of the results of the ALU is, is comparing the, the values of two numbers. So um, you can see if something is less than the other one. That's all done in the ALU. Um, and then the next stage is, uh, is a memory access stage. So maybe you need to write something to memory or read something out of memory in that, in that moment. And that is when that happens. And then the final stage is called write back. And that is where you take any results of anything that you need to write back to the registers and you put them back in the registers. And the cool thing about pipeline is that you actually just do all of that all the time. So Sorry, air is a bit dry in this room. Uh, so, 
with the pipeline, every stage is running on every clock cycle in the ideal case. So while we're uh, fetching an instruction, we're actually decoding the instruction that we just got from the previous round. And then we sort of move all this data forward. And so like then we're executing like instruction one, let's say. We're decoding instruction two and we're, we're fetching instruction three. And at some point in the ideal case, which I keep saying because there are exceptions to all of this, in the ideal case, at some moment, you can have five instructions running at the same time. Like every instruction clearly takes five clock cycles, at least in the ideal case, to run. Um, but the benefit is that you can be running five instructions in parallel. And that is really powerful. That's parallelism right there. That is a hardware parallelism that you get that just speeds up programs dramatically. So when parallelism, uh, uh, sorry, when pipelining was introduced into CPUs, it was just like game breaking, you know, that everyone immediately went to pipelining. And now, um, you know, five stage pipeline is actually pretty small. Uh, Intel chips, for instance, have very long pipelines. Um, and yeah, so like uh, pipelining is a way of squeezing parallelism out, but obviously it comes with a cost and it's a trade-off and you kind of need to work out, uh, you know, how to make it worth it. And actually the longer a pipeline is, the more uh, problems that can come up from that. Okay, uh, that's probably enough about that. I could, could talk a lot more, but let's just um, wrap this up a little bit, kind of. After all of that's done, and that is like, uh, you know, that's sometime in the future, I just want to uh, put across that there are, there are many places to go from here, like after. So once you have a CPU, you can sort of find a direction that's interesting for you and go in it. And I'm not exactly sure yet which direction I would like to go in, but you can do things like, you know, okay, let's just turn this more and more into a computer. Let's like hook it up to a VGA display. Let's, uh, let's find a way to get m like direct inputs so or maybe from a keyboard or something else in there. Let's like hook other hardware up to it. You know, turn it more into a computer and kind of have it start to do interesting jobs. Um, that's one thing you can do. Uh, you can also just sort of like just go deeper and deeper into the CPU building stuff. So you can do things like, okay, uh, uh, the, CPU, the CPU is okay at this point, but it's slow because it needs to talk to memory all the time. Let's build some, uh, let's build some caches, you know, let's build hardware caches into the CPU so it doesn't have to hit memory as much, and then it can run even faster. Um, that is a really uh, interesting road you can go down. And cache building is also a super interesting subject. And I don't know, there are some people out there on YouTube that are building uh, RISC-V CPUs, and um, I, think, uh, I think I've seen all of them that are going into some detail. Um, but yeah, things like, like going more advanced, like building things like caches, that I, I think uh, it's not explored that much, and I think it's a really interesting subject area. So I might go down that road. Um, could also go down the road of just like, further extending the RISC-V specification, so adding things like floating point support, adding things like multiply and divide and 64-bit, maybe adding another privilege level, and then like putting Linux on it, you know? Um, that would be a really uh, cool and like rewarding set of things to do. Um, there's also the side of like, I would love to turn this somehow into a game console, uh, so I would love to also build like some rudimentary graphics hardware onto the FPGA, you know, if there's space left over. And uh, and then I'm thinking something from Game Boy-ish era, so, you know, really like low color, but like some hardware that's specialized to take um, things like sprite descriptions and tiles and things like that and just like output to a, to a display. Um, I think that would be really cool. So, many places to go. I'm super excited to get going with this project. There is already at least one video online, so just check the description. You, I'll, I'll include the link to the playlist, and, you know, if you're lucky, maybe there are even a few more then. So, if you're excited, if you got to this point in the video and you're, you're excited about the project, uh, please subscribe. Please take a look at some of the other videos if, uh, if there aren't enough of these uh, around. But, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to go on. Thank you for, for joining me on this journey, and uh, I'll see you next time.